Every lie 
mounting the still being moved strongholds are still being loosed god we believe and yes we can see it that wonders are still what you do you are here you are here for The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news. And obviously, this was speaking of Jesus. But for um, each one of us, this is our commission as well. And he says, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a beautiful crown instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, and, you know, today there's no excuses for us not to praise and worship God. There's lots of room. We can take some chairs out if necessary. Um, you know, there's lots of room for us to be activated, to be worshipping God. Um, you know, whether that's you're only able to move your little finger or whether you want to jump up and down or you want to dance, there's room today for us to really be able to praise God um, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. It goes on to say they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord to display his splendour. And in the last few days, I had a really vivid picture from the Lord. And it was of a very barren, dry place. It was like a desert actually, but as far as you could see, there was just rubble and dirt and just arid, barren land. And I felt the Lord was saying, it's a warning for us. You know, we're not coming into 
really lovely days. We're coming into days, you know, where the landscape is changing um, and, you know, the environment around us is changing. And in the midst of this very dry, arid place, I saw a tree. And it was really unusual because this tree was absolutely full of fruit. And in the natural, you looked at it and you thought, how can this tree be in the midst of a barren place and yet be bearing fruit? And the Lord showed me its roots and its roots went through the dirt and the, the rubble and it went through the rock that was underneath the dirt and the rubble and it went through under the rock where the river of life was flowing. And God wants you to know that no matter what the atmosphere is around you, you are meant to be environment changers. You are meant to be people who bring hope and bring transformation, even when the environment looks awful. And God wants to say to us today, you know, we are meant to be like those oaks of righteousness. What does a tree of righteousness produce? What fruit would it be? It's not gonna produce apples or pears. You know, our fruit is righteousness. And in a world that is barren and dry and arid, you know, the world needs the fruit of righteousness to be seen. And I heard the Lord saying, in these days, people are gonna come to you because you are full of the river of God. You are drawing up. And you know, when we draw up from the river of life, we're gonna release life everywhere. And you know, I don't know what you're like, um, you know, for drinking, I'm really bad. And when my Steve is away, I get so busy doing stuff and I forget that I haven't had a drink for ages. And you know, this tree goes through the barren land and it goes through the rock and it goes right down, the roots go right down, but it will not be fruitful if it's not drawing up that water. And I felt today, you know, many of us are dehydrated physically. I, I, I'm terrible, um, you know, and I can have a glass of water alongside me and I still forget to drink from it. Is anyone else like that or is it just me? Yeah. And I felt like today the two things go together and I know kind of in mainland Europe right now, you know, the Red Cross are giving out bottles of water because the temperatures are just going through the roof um, and people need to drink more. And I really sense God is saying to you, you know, even now, I don't know where my bottle's gone, actually, I'll pinch this one here. You know, we need to take the top off, take the top off your water and have a good drink. You know, we're gonna drink in today. We're gonna drink of the Lord. We're gonna drink of His presence. We're gonna drink, you know, of His holiness. We're gonna drink of His peace. You know, some of you, Maria! I'm sorry, just Oh, sorry about that. I thought Maria was on a plane. <laughs> oh, oh, awesome. Sorry. Um, but really sense today, you know, that, that many of us are dehydrated of the, of the Word of God. You're dehydrated of Holy Spirit. You know, you're dehydrated. You don't know the Word of God. And many of us in this season were being deceived. You know, we're reading stuff on the internet. People are sending you stuff and you just believe in it. And we have to be oaks of righteousness. We have to be people who know the Word of God. We have to know the Holy Spirit leading us in these days. And so I just want us to stand together. Ali, can you just take that? Thank you. Just take the top off your water and take a drink. Father, we pray that as we gather today at Big Push, that we wanna position ourselves to hear you 
so clearly and to really drink in Your Word, to really drink in and draw in Your Holy Spirit, that we go out filled with Your holiness. We go out filled with Your peace. We go out set free. Lord, we go out healed because we are drawing on the healer. Father, we just are here today to glorify You. Lord, we're not here for just a nice time, but we are here to position ourselves to be like those oaks of righteousness in the middle of an arid, dry world. And so we pray in the Name of Jesus and we invite Holy Spirit to come and to fall afresh upon every one of us where we're dried out, where we're empty. Lord, we're not waiting till the end of today. Lord, we want You now. We want You now, God. We want Your mantle of praise to fall upon us now that we can glorify You, that we can give You the worship that You deserve. Father, we just come today and say, Lord God, we love You. We love You in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen. You said in three days you would rise, you did Now you're alive You rule, you reign You said you're coming back again I know that you will All the earth will sing your praises You took, you take our sins away, oh God You give, you gave your life away for us You came down, you saved us through the cross And our hearts are changed because of your great love sins away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. And our hearts are changed because of your great love.
just going to jump in if that's okay I just really feel I need to bring the word that the Lord's laid on my heart for today because it just comes and flows from that song 
Um, and we're going to, if we come back to that song, um, and we're going to also sing a new song that probably many of you won't know called Nineveh. But I think somehow those two are going to flow together. We just, oh, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. I'm so excited having Josh and Maria here. That was such a surprise. I feel like God's got lots of surprises for people um, today. Um, so forgive me jumping in, but I just feel that what the Lord is wanting to do um, will fit very much um, with, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, that, was, that was absolutely beautiful. Father, we just thank you um, for your presence and for your word. And Father, we pray that you would enable us to really hear what your spirit is saying in this moment, in this time, in this season, and that you would activate it by your anointing and your Holy Spirit in each one of our lives and in the lives of everybody who um, watches or listens to this um, big push in the days and the months to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I really believe that the Lord um, wants to speak to us today um, about transformation and that there are two spheres of transformational influence that God gives to his people. And the first is about our own hearts and our own lives and that's where we very often get stuck. And even during the worship um, this, this afternoon, I felt like many of us had like jackets on that were full of baggage, um, you know, that were holding you down and holding you back. Um, you can't lift your arms because they're weighed down, you know, um, with the worries of the world, with all kinds of things. And so often it becomes just about us and we get stuck in that place, don't we? And our team are probably fed up with me always saying, you know, um, we've got to stay strategic. We've got to stay in that place where we're, we're praying, you know, for um, strategic things and for the government, and for the nations and not just praying um, for our, what's going on in our own homes and families. Um, when we get beyond that, we can then pray for our communities, our towns and our cities and our nations. And when we do that, we see God move in power. And, and very often when we do the second thing, God takes care of the first. You know, I've, that's certainly been my experience over many years. And I want to share from Jonah. And if you've got your Bibles, I'm not going to read the whole um, of Jonah, but please read the whole of Jonah <laughs> um, for your homework. <laughs> Jonah 1, um, 1 to 3, the word, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And the first thing he says to Jonah is, go. And um, when we were praying um, earlier on today, Three people in our team had the word go. And um, somebody had a vision of um, a, a water with all these, these bubbles and ripples going out and green. And she was saying, I don't know what the green's about. And someone else said, oh, I've got a green light to go. And um, all this week when I had my little um, grandson in the car, um, I've been saying to him, watch for the lights, the traffic lights, because when they're green, we can go. Green is for go, Max. Green is for go. Are you watching? So when the green light came, it's like, go. Green is for go, Max. We're going. And so we really felt as we were praying today that God wants to say to us, many of us have been stuck on the red light. You know, we've been stuck on the red light for far too long. Some of us are on the amber light and we're thinking, you know, next week, next year, next decade, I'll be ready. You know, I'm getting ready. I'm not perfect yet. I'm not fixed up yet. Um, but God is saying, actually, I'm giving you a green light. And, you know, on the way here, can you just imagine when you're on your way here today, when you were at the traffic lights and the lights were green and you just sat there and you didn't move? You know, imagine 
being at a very busy junction and you know you've just decided well I'm just going to stop here it's really nice it's scenic you know I can see the mountains over there um, you know it's very beautiful um, the sky's blue you know I'm listening to a nice piece of music I'm just going to rest here you know you'd have cars tooting at you and honking at you and you would be the cause of a mega traffic jam very quickly and that's what it's like in the spirit when we're not moving when God tells us to move and I just want to unpack what happened a little bit with Jonah so God says go and I love that even though Nineveh was obviously a city full of sin that God was about to judge God called it a great city you know he sees the greatness in you when you look in the mirror and all you see are the negative things God created you to be great full stop no matter what the world has done no matter what you've done no matter what has happened to you you know you're made to be great our cities are made to be great the word of the Lord came, go to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh it had a population of 120,000 people. 120,000 people were waiting for the word of the Lord. How many people are waiting today for the word of the Lord? You know, they were waiting. Their life depended on Jonah delivering a word from the Lord but he refused. Now, we don't know why, except we know he didn't like Nineveh. He was angry about Nineveh, and he was quite happy to see them perish, actually. You know, sometimes our hearts can be like that, can't they? God called Nineveh great because he saw the potential. When God speaks, we have a choice. You know, he, again, he's brought us to Frodsham, the place that's called Listen and Hear, because he wants us to clean the wax out of our ears and really hear what his spirit is saying to us in this time where oaks of righteousness need to be bearing fruit, where we need to be drinking deep of the word of God and be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we are bearing fruit in every season for the Lord we have a choice and there will be consequences for us and others you know what has God said to you that you've ignored what has God said to you that you've blatantly disobeyed what has where has God sent you to go and you've gone the opposite way and you know we all have those experiences don't we where we've let God down where we've refused mainly because we feel we're not fit or we're not good enough and I remember being in New Zealand with Stephen and God gave me a word for a lady and I don't know why I didn't give it to her just randomly in the middle of the countryside and I didn't give it to her and we got back in our car and she got back in her car and we both went off and I was so sad in my heart because I knew I disobeyed the Lord and I don't know whether it was fear of man, I don't know where it was. Anyway, I said to the Lord, Lord, if you bring her across my path again, and we're in New Zealand, do you know what I mean? The other side of the world where there's just like loads of, you know, countryside. Um, if you bring her back to me, then I will give her the word. And about three days later, miles and miles away from where we met each other, Steve was just looking out over this particular place. And he said, there's that lady. And we were probably, there was about maybe a dozen people in this place. And so I was able to go and run down to her and say, look, I'm really sorry. I am a Christian. God spoke to me, gave me a word for you. And, you know, maybe it had even more power, the word, because actually she knew that God had given us a divine appointment. But what I want to say is when you mess up, when you get it wrong, God is the God of second chances and third chances and hundredth chances because he loves us. You know, that woman needed to hear the word that I, that I had from the Lord for her. And, you know, there are people that God crosses your path with 
you know, that, that he wants you to give a word of encouragement to. So we have a choice. Um, the word of the Lord here was very specific. You know, we don't need to wrap it up and make it sound gorgeous. You know, we don't need the pink bow on it. We don't need, you know, the cellophane wrapping to it. We just need to say what God has said. Um, and that's where the power and authority is when it's God's word. And many of us who are prophetic in particular think we've got to make it all sound, you know, um, really beautiful. But we've got to just be uncompromising in this day, particularly with God's word. Hallelujah. You know, the word in season is important. We need to know where God is, is telling us to go. And we need to know what he's telling us to do when we get there. You know, generally we'll bring words of challenge, of hope. Doesn't the world need hope right now? I mean, do you know anybody that's so full of hope they don't need hope? Everybody, everybody needs words of encouragement and hope, don't they? Um, you know, and we need to be the ones that choose to bring that, that we bring peace. Where, when people have hope, they have peace, don't they? When people have joy, you know, they, they have peace and hope. Um, and God wants to move by his spirit through his people at this time. So we know Jonah ran away from God's presence and his will, and it was very dangerous. He boarded the ship, and despite him falling asleep in the middle of the storm, you know, he had put the rest of the contents of that ship and all the people on that ship in real danger. And it wasn't long before they were having to throw um, all the goods off the ship. I mean, imagine one of the big container ships coming into Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? And um, them having to throw all the contents of that off the ship. People would be waiting for that. How is going to pay the bill for all those goods that have gone missing? And this would have been exactly the same. Some of these things might have been really valuable and desperately needed. It might have been food for people who are hungry. We don't know. It doesn't tell us what the contents were. But they had to throw everything overboard. And again, you know, the sailors at the beginning, the captain of the ship said, don't worry, we're just going to row harder. And, you know, very often as Christians, you know, instead of us going to God and saying, God, what, am I, what is the sin in my life? What am I doing wrong? We just think, I'm just going to work harder. I'm just going to try harder. You know, um, and in church, we do that, don't we? We teach people how to row the boat really hard. Um, when actually we should be saying, Lord, what do we need to do? Um, everyone loses out. Jonah eventually was, you know, they recognised he was the problem and he was thrown overboard. Now, he must have been terrified at this point because he would not have known that God was going to send this great, huge whale to swallow him um, alive. And again, you know, very often, we are in a mess uh, or our disobedience causes a mess and havoc for other people um, and we don't recognise when God sends us his rescue plan and we fight it and we resist it and we feel sorry for ourselves and we have pity parties and we complain about it um, when God actually is all the time saying, lean into me, I want your attention. They had to throw him overboard or everyone would have perished. Jonah was not a very gracious even when he was swallowed by a whale. Eventually, he began to pray and eventually he began to cry out to God. And God must have been like, oh, flipping neck at long last. You know, what have I had to do to get your attention? You know, I've sent a storm, I've done this, I've sent this big whale, you know, and still. And God wants to say to you today, you know, I've sent things and sent things and sent things to get your attention. You know, and the world around us, God is saying, are you paying attention? You know, all the uncovering of unrighteousness that's going on, we shouldn't be shocked or surprised, but we are. 
and there will be more. There will be more because God is righteous and He is uncovering things that need to be uncovered. How often do we forfeit God's grace when we're in that place of confinement? And we know the whole thing about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights was all about pointing to Jesus. You know, Matthew 12 um, verse 40 speaks of how Jesus refers to Jonah. But here the Lord commanded the whale and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Now I'm sure Jonah would not have arrived on the dry land with a nice pristine Jaeger suit on, um, you know, absolutely immaculate. He would have been stinking of all kinds of dross that the whale had swallowed. I'm sure he didn't have like a little nice shower as he came through the whale's mouth. Um, you know, he would have been absolutely stinking. And um, I believe that whale vomit actually is very, very valuable. <laughs> Honestly, it's really valuable. So if you find any on the beach, it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> Apparently so. A really lot of money. Um, I don't know what they do with it. I think they grind it up and do something. I don't know. I don't know what they do. Let's not think what they do with it. Um, but, you know, he must have arrived in Nineveh absolutely angry because he still didn't want to be there. Uh, he must have looked a sight, mustn't he? You know, covered in goodness knows what. They must have smelt him before he actually arrived, I would imagine. But God will use anybody. And that was the thing about Jonah. He was still full of anger. He still had no desire or compassion um, towards Nineveh. He had bitterness and anger and hatred in his heart. And we know that because of the end of the story. But the amazing thing is that God loves us so much. He does not wait for us to be perfect. And, you know, he doesn't wait to find a perfect vessel to minister to towns and cities. And that it blows my mind. You know, you think, couldn't he have found somebody better than Jonah, you know, to go? But when God calls you, arise and go because God empowers you. He provides for you. He opens the doors that need to be opened that you can't open. He resources you in everything that you need. Romans 8, 19 says, All creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The people of Nineveh were waiting Wherever you're from today, you know, whether it's Bootle or Warrington or Southport or Solihull or Southampton or Aqua, you know, people are waiting eagerly for the word of the Lord. People are waiting for us to arise full of God's spirit because we stand out because we're full of hope and life and peace and joy where the world can only offer the latest bad news or the latest gossip. God wants us to be full of his word, full of his spirit so that we can see communities and lives restored and re people released into their destinies. The biggest issue I really believe about the church is that people have no clue who they are in their identity as children of God. They don't know who they are and they don't know why God created them. And, you know, we need to be encouraging people because the Spirit of God inside of us is everything we need. As we just soak in His Word and His presence Romans, again, what a great book. Chapter 10, verse 14 says, how can people call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? The people of Nineveh were waiting for someone to tell them the truth. And you know, Nineveh had to, had to hear the word of the Lord it wasn't a nice, cozy, lovely, 
word wrapped up. It wasn't a hopeful word. It was eight words. And we need to trust God that when God gives you a word, that His power and authority and anointing is going to come upon that word and it will not return void. God, God's responsibility to bring that word to pass. It's not yours, it's not mine. We just are the vessel to deliver um, the word the Lord has given us. Isaiah the prophet said in um, Isaiah 55 verse 11, so it is that goes, that goes from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God will enforce his word. It's our responsibility to go and to deliver. So Jonah walked into the city, just imagine the state, and began to release God's word. Stinky, smelly, looking a mess. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And that's all he said. Eight words, eight words, and eight words with the power of God turned a city completely 180 degrees. Isn't that amazing? Eight, just eight words, just eight words, packed full of the power of a holy God. It convicted people of sin. Jonah brought no hope whatsoever. He didn't say, if you repent, God will, you know, change his mind. He never gave them any hope at all. But the people believed the word and they turned to God anyway. Even though that word was so full of, of hopelessness, really, it was just a word of absolute judgment. But the people turned to God they responded to God's word and they turned from the wickedness and they began to fast and to cry out to God and they humbled themselves in deep repentance and grief. And then the king said, who knows that God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that they will not perish. And it was simple, four steps for eight words. The word came, God gave Jonah the green light, go. Number two, then the people believed, the people believed and genuinely repented. Thirdly, the king heard, can you hear the order of this? That then the king heard, and laid aside his robe in place of sackcloth. Then God moved in mercy and compassion and relented from releasing disaster upon the people. And, you know, God is saying to us in this day, you know, are we prepared to receive his word? Are we prepared to go where God sends us? You know, Diana's been going um, with their ministry that she's involved with called Crossing Point and she's going into schools and she's going into places and she's bringing the word of God regarding domestic violence and it's powerful and I really believe lives are being changed. She's not sitting at home just praying about it and there's power in prayer but very often there's action in prayer as well. And, you know, for many of us, there's an action that God is saying, you receive my word and you pray about it, but you must go. You must start going and bringing my word. We've done a lot of praying about the slave trade. And we never thought in 1999 when we started praying that God would have us go. Never knew that we were going to meet the beautiful Maria and her husband Justice and be involved right at the front end in Cape Coast with Ali and others, you know, in, in seeing this terrible curse of the slave trade beginning to break. And, you know, it's powerful when you begin to receive a word and when you begin to pray, 
and when you're obedient. If God had said to me and Ali going up the steps of that plane, you don't need to go, we'd have gone hallelujah. Because it was out of our comfort zone. And I'm sure for Maria and Justice, it was out of their comfort zone. We were having to deal with decades of history, decades of mindsets, you know, that, that God wanted to shatter and break. But you know, God wants you to say, yes, I'll go. And even when you're scared, you know, even when your legs are shaking, even when, you know, it's way out your comfort zone, God is saying, this is the day the light is green. And here, you know, they receive the word. Then the people repented. And then the king repented and called the fast. And then God moved in compassion. And, you know, we are in a day where we need to see our nation shift. Big style. You know, I'm sure when God looked at Nineveh, that was what revival looked like. People were no longer angry and bitter and jealous and, you know, envious about each other. They were no longer fighting each other. They were no longer, you know, competing against each other. They were no longer, you know, contesting one another. And there would be reconciliation and there would be healing and there would be love just pouring out as the sin just began to drop away from people because their hearts were totally broken in repentance. And we don't understand that. And God is wanting to bring us to that place where our hearts break with the sin. That we're so heartbroken of the, the separation of a sinful world from a holy God, that we're willing to go wherever he tells us to go and to bring his word. God was full of compassion. He just looked for a man. And he looks for men and women today who will just deliver the word. You know, his heart was terrible, <laughs> Jonah. You know, it was not great. It wasn't a great delivery. You know, you wouldn't go and go, you know, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go full of whale vomit. You know, that would not be his desire. You know, he didn't look smart. He didn't smell nice. It must have been offensive to him. You know, he, he probably would have been wanting to say, I've just been in this whale. He would have wanted to have the news of the world and all the media there and tell them about photographs of him coming out the whale's mouth. But it wasn't like that. He just said eight words. That's certainly all the Bible has recorded for us. Jesus, full of compassion, stretched out his hand everywhere he went. He fed people, he cleansed lepers, he opened blind eyes, he healed the sick. Why shouldn't we be doing that every day? We need our heart, we've spoken before, conjoined with the heart of God to empower us so that we're full of that same compassion for the people who God loves so much, despite how they choose to live their lives. Jonah didn't go and, and start labeling them. He didn't start describing their sin. He didn't start you know, calling them names, you ugly sinners, you doing this and this and this. And we get so lost as the church, don't we? When we should just be loving on people and bringing the word of God. And that's what he did. This is what God did. He changed lives. God watches today how we care about people, how we minister his word, how we govern, how we live, how we work, how we rest and play uh, within our towns and our cities. And he watches how we respond in relationally, emotionally, strategically. How do we speak to people? When we refuse the Great Commission and watch our communities self-destruct all around us, it's evident that we need our hearts transformed. The world is watching and we must be people of integrity. I wonder if Steve, you could start coming back. 
Good. We must be people of integrity. You know, the world is looking and expecting integrity. It's interesting, isn't it? Interesting. In these days when so many are being exposed, and I'm not going to name names, I don't need to. It's in the chat, it's in the media, it's in the world. Go, and it'll go on and on. But God is awesome. He's holy and he's amazing and he's extravagant and he's ready to do immeasurably more than you can ever dream or imagine through you. <sighs> through you, not just the person in front of you, not just the person behind you, but through you. Through you, if you're sitting watching this at home. God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life right now. I sense that God today just wants to deal with some things as we um, come back to worship in just a moment. If you've disobeyed God, the good news is he's not here with a big stick to beat you around the head. He's just saying, just repent. Turn around, say you're sorry. If you've refused to bring God's word, and suddenly you realize God's not speaking to you anymore. When God's saying, actually, I've already spoken and you haven't done what I told you. You know, God wants you to deal with that today. If you have a heart, a bit like Jonah, that was full of anger and bitterness, you know, we can't so easily judge other people. We can look at their sin and we can be their judge and their jury. And sometimes they're hangman as well. And, and God, you know, he's a merciful God. And where we're full of anger and judgment, he wants to deal with our hearts. Lots of people in, who've been getting exposed recently have been living a lie. And I know what that feels like. For 17 years, I was forced to live somebody else's lie. And it was excruciating because like these people whose lives have just been exposed to the world, I lived with this cloud over my life every single day, wondering if today would be the day when the secrets would be exposed that I was being forced to comply with. And it was killing me. And I suffered with um, depression for 17 years, in and out, and out. it was awful really bad. I couldn't see a way out. I was full of hopelessness. And I really sense today that there are people here and people watching this and listening and you've been living a lie and it might be something that, that's happened to you, something that you've done, something that someone else has done and you're just being forced to comply. And God wants to say that's a lie. He wants you set free today. You know, I found that because I was living a lie, I was anxious and I was depressed. And I believe that many people who are anxious and depressed, it's rooted in you not being free. And very often you're living something that is not the truth of your identity. We want to pray with you today and we're going to go, go in and sing Nineveh shortly. But I just want you to stand right now. You, know, you might be here today or you might be watching this on the screen and you know, you've never heard of the mercy of God. And you just felt the rejection and the pain that the world and family may have given you. But God wants you to know today, He loves you unconditionally. He loves you, He loves you, He loves you, He loves you. He's full of love. 
He's full of compassion and He's ready with His arms open wide to welcome you into His family. And all it takes is for us to repent. You know, we don't just ask Jesus into our heart, we repent. And that means we say, God, I'm sorry that I have messed up, I've been disobedient, I've sinned, I've broken your heart, God, and I'm sorry. And actually, I'm not gonna say I'm sorry and then just carry on doing the same old thing. Actually, I'm gonna turn completely around and I'm gonna look into your eyes, God, and I'm gonna let you empower me to change and to be the person you've made me to be. And if that's you today, please come forward. We're gonna pray for you today. And I'm just gonna pray a prayer of salvation right now. And let's just pray it together. Father, we thank you that you are a holy God. And even though you are awesome, you love us even when we are sinners. And today, we repent. That means we're saying we are truly sorry for every way that we have sinned and we have been separated from you. And today, I choose to turn away from those things. And I ask you to receive my whole life today. Everything that I am, all my finances and relationships, my past and my present and my future. And I thank you that as I ask you right now, you will come and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. So we ask Holy Spirit to come right now. Just ask him, open your heart, open your hands out right now and just invite Holy Spirit. Invite him to come right now just to help you, just to let go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're just gonna continue to worship for a moment before we sing Nineveh. And while we do, if you need prayer today on any of those things we've spoken about, please come forward. This is not gonna be a, you know, a prophecy session. We are just gonna come in agreement with what God is doing in your life. So we just wanna give you an opportunity. You can either, it's best if you come to the front because there's more room here. Um, so we just want to give you that opportunity right now. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Oh 
I just want to um, ask Dave um, just to share what happened um, at the last big push um, because you know when you share a testimony God does it again and again and again because he's, he's that kind of God isn't he and, and Dave sent me a message after the last big push to say um, that he had a powerful encounter um, with God that A he wasn't expecting and be dealing with things that he didn't even know he was carrying. And you know, Ali has just said to me, why is it always the women that come forward? I wanna say, man, why is it always the women that come forward? But you know, I really believe there are more people here and you're carrying stuff that God wants to deal with and he's, he can deal with it in an instant, can't he? Because he's good. I came to um, a big push, um We'd had the Friday evening and all I heard, and it was wonderful, was about God's faithfulness. And I came um, to Big Push and um, I was sat just here and the canvas, um, Becky had done it, I think it was purple. I thought, well, that's really interesting. I know nothing about art and thought, that's really interesting. And um, I was expectant. I was really looking forward to seeing God do something. And um, as the meeting, got close as time has started. Um, I, I was just, this is gonna be great. And then all of a sudden, um, I was looking for Steve to you know, start the meeting. And as soon as the first note, it was as if the first note was played, a wall of praise just went up. And when we talk about walls, you always think of it being negative. But I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean it in a real way of, something that is um got real substance to it and um i from january this year to about may i'd had about nine different things where we were ministering into that were really quite challenging quite difficult you know and i it's just part it's just i know it's, we can say it's just part of life and it can be and and i was carrying something and i wasn't aware of the weight it was on me. But as that worship went off, something went off. Something was literally lifted off me. And, um, and it wasn't just in the moment, I can say, um, that I was saying to Steve earlier, I, I know there was a conversation about the second or the third song. I was still back on the first song. I, don't, I, I can't really remember because I was determined not to lose what God, what the Spirit of God was saying. 
So I just lingered in that presence and I want to encourage you to linger. I left um, the meeting and I sat in my car and um, as, I was, as, I, as I was just driving home, I knew that I didn't have something with me that I came with. And it was just a weight. And you know, sometimes we carry stuff that's just time just to give it up. I know it might just be life, you know, because bad things happen to us, don't they? And in ministry, we're carrying some other people's burdens, maybe, or maybe it's our family's burdens or whatever it is. But there comes a time when God says, I'll lift that off you. And you just have to humble yourself and let go. And can I just say, I did nothing besides just sit there. But I was firm and just fixing my eyes on God. I'm going to worship you. I didn't know I had an issue. I didn't realize I had a weight until I started to draw near. So I want to encourage you, if you're carrying anything, maybe it's time to give it up. Maybe it's time just to say, God, if you want to have it. I'll just surrender that to you now. You know, sometimes we, we just carry stuff when it's time to give it up. So as we worship, these guys carry an anointing of, the, of God just... Just give it up. It's God who does. It's not us. But we do have to just let go. Pray for the men. Okay, men, let's stand up. So much is expected of of men, isn't it? Be strong, be this, be whatever. It's nonsense. Let's be us, eh? Father God, I want to thank you for every man in this room. I want to thank you for each of them. I want to thank you for the plans and purposes that you have for them. Lord, we pray for more of us. We ask for an increase, an overwhelming increase of men who will come to Big Push. And you should have been saying amen there. You should have been saying, Father God, release to bring them in. Maybe you need to bring them. Father God, I want to thank you for the men that we do have. Increase them. Father God, I want to pray for everything that would inhibit us. Lord, we just want to lift it to you now. Lord, for the things that would constrain us, our age, our health, whatever. Father God, we want to say we're your children. Father, revitalize us. Cause us to soar. Renew our strength. Father God, we ask for more for the men. Father God, give them more, Lord. Give them more than what they'd even ask for. Father God, show them that we don't have to be strong in our own strength, but in yours. Father God, position us where you want us to be. Stand us down from the places we shouldn't be in and position us where we should be. Father God, raise us up as men and women. Lord, you know our place and position in you. Father God, cause us to be your children cause us to live like children even if we're getting on a little bit now we'll always be your children but Father God I pray that we would just oh Father God just be saturated with your love and excitement Father God I thank you Lord even as we read in scripture when um, you, you bumped into that funeral party you turned it round and you raise that dead boy. And I pray, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll be bumping into us before we leave this place today. For the folks who are watching online, Father God, I pray that they would have an encounter with you right now. Lord, whatever situations they're in, I pray for the men watching online. Steer them up, Father God. Refocus them. For those men who are disappointed, with church and with church life. Father God, draw them to yourself. Lord, we thank you, it's about you. It's about being in a relationship with you. Lord, we do ask. Lord, we want to come against every plan and scheme of the enemy to blindside the men and tie them up with all sorts of rubbish, brokenness and hurt. And we truly ask you, Father God, to release a harvest of men. Lord, and we pray for that you'd release them into a big push. And we pray for that as we gather next month, we'll see them. It won't just be a by faith. It'll be in faith. Lord, stare us, Lord. 
steer us and draw us to yourself. Amen.
Just see. 
broken I might stand in this holy what it's all about isn't it um you know coming into that intimate place where nothing inhibits you from coming into god's presence it's so important um i just want to introduce chris um who um is one of our team and chris is gonna lead us in communion right now um and also just to say uh, if you'd like to give towards Big Push and enabling us to continue what we're doing um, to, to bless King's Church as they allow us to use their building um, and just to cover the cost, there's um, some gift aid envelopes around and the lovely Julie, where are you Julie? Julie, um, we'll, we'll take any card payments or you can give through the website as well. Oh, thank you, Josh. Josh, we need you here. We, we need you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, would you like to come? Thank you. This is... Just close your eyes and let the Holy Spirit settle on you. This is a holy moment that we're experiencing. It's so easy to take communion for granted. I'll be honest, I've done that many times. Take the bread, drank the wine, haven't even thought about what I was doing, something we do in church, do it regularly. But this is a holy moment. And the Lord just wants to remind us of a few things this afternoon. He gives us instruction in 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 23 to 32. And it starts with this, for I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And it's the next verse that he wants to remind us about. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworth unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. 
This is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by God, we are being dis disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the, word, the world. Examine yourself is mentioned twice. And we know that often when we go to the doctors, it can be a preliminary examination. We know as men, as women and men, that if you, you know how to test yourself for testicular cancer or breast cancer, and you may discover something, that's a preliminary examination. And then you go on and you have a further examination. Why does the Lord repeat it twice? Because sometimes we're aware that there's something going on in our hearts. So he's emphasizing the examining yourself because maybe we need to take it further. I remember when I was a green Christian, had no Christian background, it's weddings, Christians, funerals, and to me they were all the same. And when I became a Christian, it was like the first thing the Lord did with me. When I went to bed at night, he would show me what I needed to repent of and it became such a joy. It wasn't a condemnation. He was showing me things in my heart. He was showing me things I'd done. He was showing me th th who people who I needed to forgive. And in a way, it became like a game. It was an exciting game. I'd look forward to it every night. What do I need to repent of tonight? But I didn't know it was a repentance. And what did I come to realize? Creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. But the Lord wanted relationship with me. And as, as I, I didn't know the power of repentance, I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I knew my heart was changing and I knew my relationship with the Holy Spirit was deepening. So going to Him with my sin became a joyful thing because there was no fear in it. I knew there would be freedom. And maybe someone's here today, and you need to hear that, that going to him in, and letting him examine your heart and do a thorough job can be a very joyful thing because it brings a freedom and a liberty. And by and large, we're very good at this. We know we need to forgive. We know we need to repent. But the Lord wants to take us further in that. And in Matthew 5, verses 43 onwards, this is what Jesus has to say. And it's gotta be Jesus, because it's in red in my Bible. So these are his words. You have heard the Lord that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as two, true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sit, sends rain on the just and the just alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father is in heaven. Bless your enemies. Pray for your enemies, those that persecute you. Anybody got any troublesome neighbours? Problems with work colleagues, friends and family? And sometimes we forget the two are going hand in hand. We're good at the forgiving. But what about the blessing on those that don't like you, that are not interested in you, that don't want to sit next to you at work or even in church? And I've, what I've developed is when I take communion myself and someone comes to mind who doesn't like me, and I can't understand why anybody wouldn't like me, <laughs> but the reality is there are people that do not like me. And, and so when I hold the bread and the wine, I begin to say, Father, will you bless X? Will you always make sure their needs are met? 
Will you bring healing to their mind? Will you give them revelation? Will you bring them joy in, in their household? And what it does, it's releasing them, but it's also changing my heart and setting me free from the effects of the negativity that someone else is trying to put on me. I don't always feel like doing that. I could be like David, kill them, send them to hell, do whatever you like with them. I'm... But even David said, but yet I will praise God. So there's two things, examine yourself. It's mentioned twice. Maybe it's an initial examining today. And maybe when you go home and you get into bed tonight, give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do a deep cleanse in, in your heart. So we're gonna examine ourselves. We're gonna bless and pray for those that don't like us. And thirdly, I wanna encourage you to receive your inheritance that Jesus has paid for as you take the bread and wine. And I wanna encourage some people, I, I hear in my own church, too many people talk about my mental health, my arthritis. Well, if you've spoken like that, get divorced from Arthur and say goodbye to your mental health because you've got the mind of Christ. You do not own your sickness. Jesus took it on the cross. He doesn't have it, it's in the grave. So whatever's going on in your body or your mind, it's the great exchange today that you can give him whatever it is, your sickness, your mental health problems, your attitude, your hatred, your unforgiveness. Give it to him and receive in faith. And if you're saying you're unworthy after what's been a wonderful afternoon, if you're still saying you're unworthy, I want you to repent of partnershiping with a lie, partnershiping with fear, partnershiping with unbelief. For the truth is, as, as Sue's been sharing, we need to know our identity in Christ. We're his child. Jesus took an awful death so that you and I can receive our inheritance while we're alive. There is power in the blood and the bread, but you either empower it or disempower it in your own life. One, by the way you take it, by not examining yourself. Two, by not blessing those who don't like you. And three, by refusing to receive what is rightfully yours. So as you take communion today, I want you to come in faith. Come in faith that that's gonna make a difference. And remember afresh. So Father, as we take communion today, may your Holy Spirit stir up in our hearts those things you wanna examine in my life, Lord those attitudes, those things that I don't even know that are there. But you've said I come boldly to the throne of grace in times of trouble. And you've said I can come boldly, that I'm not a pauper, I'm not a second class Christian. Otherwise you wouldn't use the word boldly. Why do you tell me to come boldly, Father? Because you want me running towards you when I'm a mess. If I run away from you, the devil is waiting. Father, thank you that there's power and authority and anointing and freedom and healing in the bread and blood of Jesus. So Father, we come in faith in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. There are three stations, two at the front and one at the back. I would encourage you, just spend a moment examining yourself and then come and take in faith. Amen. Reveal your cross to me How you paid the price 
Gave your life to death A willing sacrifice Reveal your cross to me How they cried for you To be crucified Not believe in you And I see your blood Running down for me And it breaks me It breaks me inside Reveal your cross to me How they wounded you When they whipped you till they disfigured you How they tore your clothes Left you naked there Made a crown of thorns And placed it on your head And I see Your blood Running down For me And it breaks breaks me inside and I fall down I fall down at your feet Lord Jesus yes I fall down I fall down at your I give all to you I give all to you Reveal your cross to me How you bore the pain When they drove the nails Through your hands and feet how you took my shame When they spat at you When they mocked your name King of the Jews And I see your blood Running down for me And it breaks me It breaks and I fall down, I fall down at your feet, Lord Jesus, yes I fall down, I fall down at your feet, Lord Jesus. I give all to you I give all to you Reveal your cross to me How then darkness came How God turned away And you cried his name Reveal your love to me how you face the grave How you conquered death And you rose again When I see your love Flowing down for me And it breaks me It breaks me inside I fall down, 
Thank you for your blood shed for me. 